For tonight's presentation, uh, we would like you to make welcome Mary Johnson. She will be discussing women in the Civil War, and that's a very interesting topic. And uh, I don't think she's going to be discussing just the women that you've heard so much about. She's going to be discussing other wonderful women who made contributions. So we'll be excited to hear what she has to say. Let's make welcome Mary Johnson. Before I start, uh, I don't believe Bobby gave you the times on the two sesquicentennial lectures. Joe's lecture on the 20th, which is next Thursday, is at 12.30 here in the library. And Dr. Sheehan Dean's lecture on Friday is at 10 o'clock in the morning. So you can, those are unusual times for us, but we have both of those posted on our website. So you can find out more information about those. Uh, well, Bobby is certainly right. I'm not planning to talk about Nancy Hart and Bell Boy. Neither one of them get any mention whatsoever. So <laughs> that uh, are those are the two most famous women from West Virginia who are associated with the Civil War. At 6 o'clock on the morning of June 2nd, 1861, a Sunday, Abby Kerr and Mary McLeod of Fairmont began a ride to Philippi that the stunned spectator claimed will live in history and they will become the heroines of many a thrilling story of fiction in years to come. At Philippi, <coughs> two informed Colonel Porterfield in command Confederate troops there of the planned attack by Union troops. Although the warning accomplished nothing, after the battle was over, Abby and Mary, who had spent the night nearby, returned to Philippi in disguise to see what had happened. While there, they found a member of the Rockbridge Cavalry and rescued him by passing him off as a soap peddler. When Colonel Benjamin Kelly learned that the two young women, what they had done, he offered a thousand dollar reward for their capture. Abby Carr and Mary McLeod fled east, arriving in Richmond later in the month. Their deed was detailed in more than one southern paper at the time, and an account appeared in the Southern Literary Messenger in 1863. That their deed received such press at the time can be attributed not only to the fact that it was heroic, after all, Abby and Mary were at risk of capture several times during their journey from Fairmont to Philippi, but also to the fact that it was carried out by women. 19th century norms did not include women engaging in such activity. Women were considered part of the domestic sphere, and as such, their role was seen as caring for their families being supportive of their husbands if they were married, serving as moral touchstones for family and community, and as an extension of their perceived piety, engaging in charitable and reform work, but not worrying about economic or political issues. In reality, this idealized view of women primarily was open to middle class women, not those forced by circumstance into factory or other outside labor or living in rural or frontier areas. When war came in 1861, women in Western Virginia, both those with Confederate sympathies and those who supported the Union, responded to the war in different ways. Many women supported the war effort through activities traditionally associated with women. A few others stretched the definition of what was acceptable for women to do, taking traditional activities in the home and extending them out to the public. Some women, most notably Confederate women, pushed the boundaries of what normally would have been considered ladylike behavior with open displays of their sympathies, displays which drew the admiration of Confederate men 
who under other circumstances no doubt would have frowned on such behavior. Other women performed heroic deeds to assist troops or in defense of their homes. Some women went even further, engaging in direct, violent action against the enemy, sometimes with the encouragement of local guerrillas. A few women, for a variety of reasons, donned male clothing and joined the military or pretended to be soldiers. The majority of women attempted to continue the work they had performed before the war, but in a greater capacity in order to support the men who went into battle. As men prepared to leave for war, wives or other female family members prepared items for them to take. I have been putting the last finishing touches to poor Sill's clothes, marking his shirts and stockings and baking pies, cakes and bread, and boiling meat for his provisions on the march to Clarksburg, Marcia Phillips of French Creek, the 25-year-old wife of Sylvester Phillips, wrote on June 21, 1861, a few days before her husband and his volunteer company left for drill under U.S. troops. Both Union and Confederate women sewed flags, and the newspapers occasionally included mention of flag presentations to military units. Sometimes these women were identified individually, often not. And what you would commonly find is they would say, the ladies present this flag, and there would be a man who would actually make the speech. Women also contributed sewn items or food for soldiers not in their immediate families. In October 1861, women in the Bell District of Ohio County formed a knitting society to make stockings and mittens for soldiers. The Ladies Union Aid Society of Wheeling, between its organization on May 28, 1861 and November 29, made 389 flannel shirts, 178 check shirts, 400 havelocks, 152 pairs of socks, 200 handkerchiefs, 108 comforts, 74 pairs of pillow slips, 50 woolen hoods, 20 neck comforts, 500 needle cases, 4 pair of pantaloons, 1 vest, 1 blanket, 2 boxes of lint, 1 box of bandages, 200 towels, one pair of suspenders, one silk dressing gown, I can imagine what the soldiers were going to do with a silk dressing gown, one woolen dressing gown, and 17 pairs of drawers. Meanwhile, in Hardy County, Rebecca Van Meter, 62, noted that on May 31st, that she had heard there was 50 or more ladies sewing at the Confederate soldiers' clothes and women were baking bread and boiling meat for them as well. A few months later, she wrote in her diary, Carrie Alexander and Hannah Fox come. They were two of the ladies appointed to bag socks or yarn and anything they could get for the soldiers, flannel shirts, comforts, anything for cold weather. We gave them $10 each of us, May 30. In Clarksburg, a ladies' union aid society was organized to help the military hospital. The women met with but little encouragement, many impediments having been thrown in their path to the good by the less deserving, which would have frightened back less noble and courageous spirits, a letter writer to the Wheeling Intelligencer observed. The women persisted, however, holding several fundraising suppers to benefit the hospital. The society also provided clothing, fruit, and other items to local soldiers serving in distant locations. One particularly intrepid young woman, Molly Sturm of Bingaman, 
spent five days riding over a sparsely populated section of Marion County to collect $72 for the benefit of soldiers. Women long had nursed family members or other women as needed, but the Civil War opened the door for ordinary women to broaden the field of nursing. And I guess I would say at the start of the war, it was common for men to, in, in the military setting, in the camps, to be the nurses to the extent that they were there. Women were not seen as performing those kind of activities outside of their families or close relations and, and friends. Lydia Holliday of Wheeling was almost 60 years of age when the war began. She was married, the mother of several children. Several of her sons served the Union during the Civil War. <coughs> Lydia was a volunteer nurse for several years, working at the Sprig House Hospital and the Anthonyum Hospital in Wheeling, as well as at Winchester and Bull Run. According to her obituary, during the war, Lydia Holliday became known for her untiring efforts to alleviate the hardships and sufferings of the soldiers. She rendered aid to many veterans in their hour of need, and they, in expressing their appreciation of her kindness, fittingly termed her mother. Margaret Anna Parker, Margaret Crampton, Nancy Furby, and Clemency Shelley were among other women who also worked at Sprig House Hospital. And Nancy Jane Brand served at the Sprig, the General Hospital in North Wheeling, and at the Athenaeum. Most of these women were in their 20s or 30s at the time. One Wheeling woman, Melissa Porter, was a milliner. She spent several months aiding sick and wounded soldiers in Washington. Another group of women who served as nurses in Wheeling during the war were members of the Sisters of St. Joseph. It is not surprising that the Sisters of St. Joseph would be involved in nursing soldiers. Not only did nuns account for some 20% of army nurses around the country during the war, but when the war began, the order was already involved in health care in Wheeling the first nursing sisters having arrived in 1853 to operate Wheeling Hospital. In fact, according to Barbara Howe, Wheeling Hospital was the first hospital in Western Virginia to provide nursing sisters. Among the women who worked as Army nurses were sisters Mary Immaculate, her original, her given name was Mary Feeney, and she was the mother superior from 1860 to 1864. Mary Ignatius, she was Mary Jane Farley, and she was from Marshall County. Mary Stanislaus, she was Mary Holman of Wheeling. Mary DeChantel, Jane Keating, she was not from the Ohio County area. She was the mother superior from 1864 on. Aloysius, whose birth name was Honor of Sullivan, and Sister Vincent. Following the Union surrender at Harper's Ferry in September 1862, the hospital in Wheeling cared for soldiers wounded in the battle. The sisters later provided care for both Union and Confederate soldiers, as well as military prisoners at the Athenaeum. And in the spring of 1864, a wing of Wheeling Hospital became a post hospital. Later, the hospital became a general military hospital. According to Sister Ignatius, we had to keep them, more of them in tents in the yard than inside the hospital. We had no trained nurses, for there were no nursing schools. We had only the benefit of home and practical training. There were so few of us that it was necessary to work almost without stop to care for the sufferers who poured into the city to be treated at the government hospital. They were from both armies, and of course no difference was made in the manner of their care. 
officers and soldiers in blue or gray, or simply diseased, starved people. They were all the same to us. Behind Confederate lines, when Emily Mason, a native Kentuckian, and more recently a resident of Fairfax, Virginia, arrived in Metabla in late 1861, the 46-year-old woman found that every house near the camp, every bar, every cabin was filled with sick and wounded soldiers. And in Lewisburg, conditions were the same. Determined to provide nursing to the Confederate soldiers, she obtained the assistance of the Sisters of Charity from South Carolina. Sisters Mary Ignatius Clark, Mary DeSales Brennan, Mary Bernard Frank, Mary Helena Marlowe, and Stanislaus Coventry were sent to the Old White at White Sulphur Springs, arriving on Christmas Eve in 1861 and remaining until May 10, 1862, when they were forced to abandon the hospital as Union troops advanced into Greenbrier County. Turning to another group of women, during the war, some women, particularly those with Confederate sympathies, defiantly expressed their sympathies in front of Union troops and other Union supporters. Partly in response, Union officials began to take a harder line with Confederate women, requiring women as well as men to take the oath of allegiance when requested and arresting those who refused. In August 1862, a group of women from Parkersburg, several of them were cousins of Stonewall Jackson, were taken to Wheeling and placed in the debtor's apartment for refusing to take the oath of allegiance to the United States. According to one newspaper, the women had been very profuse in their professions of sympathy with the rebels but a short stay in Wheeling convinced them to take the oath. And the Wheeling paper listed a number of women who were brought to Wheeling for the similar charge. And from the accounts in the paper, they eventually did take the oath of allegiance. A year later, in August 1863, a writer to the Wheeling Intelligencer claimed that a bevy of grown-up girls at the house of a Mrs. Lewis in Charleston cheered repeatedly and vociferously for Jeff Davis right in the face of the federal officers. In reply, another correspondent to the paper denied the girls had done so in the face of the Union officers but acknowledged that they had cheered for Davis. The respondent continued, before this reaches your office, some of these same ladies will have reached their own place in Dixie, and others will speedily follow if they are sufficiently curious to try the experiment again. Other Confederate women presented a different kind of challenge for Union troops. Louisa Hayes, wife of Peregrine Hayes, a well-to-do resident of Calhoun County, ran their farm in her husband's absence. And Perry Hayes was with the Confederate Rangers in the region. In 1864, Captain W.P. Wyant of the Gilmer County Home Guard wrote, now, this said Mrs. Hayes has been protected, although an avowed rebel, in the possession of her husband's property ever since the war. She uses his property carrying on farming quite extensively, raising livestock, grain, etc. This said Mrs. Hayes took last winter two fine horses and her eldest son beyond our lines into the so-called Southern Confederacy and left them both, horses and son. It is sure from all the evidence I can get that she is protected in raising and furnishing horses, money, goods, etc., to her husband, and he fighting against us, and she holds frequent communication with her 
husband. Captain Wyant further wrote that important county records were missing. When Louisa Hayes was asked about them, she stated that they would be restored to the proper authorities at the proper time. According to Wyant, it was the same as if she had said, I know where said records are, and they will be returned only to the enemies of the United States and the state of West Virginia. Louisa Hayes' younger sister, and Amy Silcott, was the wife of George Silcott, Calhoun County clerk before the war, who was also serving with the Rangers. In 1862, Major George Trimble of the 11th West Virginia Infantry reported to the Adjutant General that the 26-year-old Amy Silcott was in the habit of issuing marriage licenses to the residents of Calhoun County and that some 12 or 15 weddings had been the result. Trimble told her to stop and she replied that she would implicitly obey. However, two years later, Captain Wyant reported that Amy Silcott had been acting as clerk in her husband's name ever since the war, issuing marriage licenses without ever having taken the oath herself. Obviously, the war placed women in the position of dealing with business that their husbands or other male family members had done before the war. Isabella Woods of Barber County, who was the wife of secessionist Samuel Woods, who had been indicted in Wheeling for treason, was left to deal with her husband's accounts and also was confronted with several claims against him. Mary Hughes of Wheeling was the wife of Dr. Alfred Hughes, who was then at Camp Chase for refusing to take the oath of allegiance. She informed her husband in June of 1862 about the sale of a horse hoping all I have done may meet your approbation, as I have no one to consult with. I had to act for myself. When Sylvester Phillips was sick in October and November 1861, Marsha Phillips made out the company payrolls. That was Company E of the 3rd West Virginia Infantry, and issued furloughs. She then sent them off by the courier one to the Adjutant General of the U.S. and the other to the Paymaster, two rolls in each envelope, and S, SIL, keeps a duplicate. For several months in 1861, Ellen Wilkins Tompkins, wife of Confederate Colonel Christopher Tompkins, lived at their home, Golly Mount, in Fayette County, surrounded by a Union encampment. Under the protection of General Jacob Cox, Mrs. Tompkins and her children were unmolested, even though troops battled in the area. Her property also received more <coughs> protection than was common, which angered the soldiers. But one suspects that her determination to keep her property as intact as possible also limited her losses. Ellen Tompkins described herself as a great coward, naturally. But since her husband's departure, she presented a fearless face to everyone. A passage from a letter she wrote to her sister Sarah after <coughs> some 2,000 men were encamped on the field next to the kitchen says much about Ellen Tompkins. <coughs> and this actually, I don't know whether you can read these. This is from another letter that she wrote and again that reflects her uh, <coughs> firm dealings. When I saw them measure the field, I sent Joe to tell the superior officer to come to me. I asked him by whose authority he was acting. He showed me General Cox's order. I told him I did not acknowledge the right to intrude on me. Yeah, you wanted to fix that. <laughs> uh, he said it was military necessity. I told him to say convenience. I fought long to save us the annoyance, 
I then sent a message by the officer to General Cox to say that I would give up the use of one stable, the vineyard house for a hospital, the overseer's house for the commissary, but there must be a division. I must have my part undisturbed. General Cox agreed, and really considering, I am not so much intruded upon. Although she initially determined to stay at Golly Mount to save the place, she eventually concluded she could not stay through the winter with fighting to resume again in the spring. In December 1861, Ellen Tompkins and her two young sons left for Richmond to join her husband and other children. Ellen Tompkins was not alone in choosing to leave. Two Fairmont women, Maria Boggess Heyman, wife of Alpheus Heyman, and Sarah Jane Neeson, wife of James Neeson, were on their return from visiting their husbands in Virginia when they were stopped by federal authorities in late June 1862 near Philippi. And I would say that it, I don't know how common it was, but it did happen that the military would issue passes for these women to go visit their husbands, and they would come back. Uh, but this time, things didn't quite work out that way. Orders came from General Benjamin Kelly that the women had to leave permanently. On July 18th, the two women started for Huttonsville, accompanied by Mrs. Henry Pride and Mrs. Coleman Carr of Fairmont. Isabella Woods, and that's who you see there, and more than a dozen children. The journey took them to Augusta County, Virginia. They would remain beyond the borders of West Virginia until the war had ended. How many women went south, or in a few cases north, during the war is not known. But that undoubtedly was not an option for most women. And with Isabella Woods, <coughs> she debated for a while. She wanted to go, she wasn't sure that the costs of living over in Eastern Virginia was something she could handle, and she kept thinking about it, and then when the op opportunity presented itself in the fact that Maria Heyman and Sarah Neeson, who by the way was her sister-in-law, <coughs> her brother, was James Neeson. Uh, she took the opportunity and went. But that was, you know, obviously if cost is a factor in whether you can just pick up and move, then a lot of women weren't going to be able to just do that. These women had to stay and meet wartime struggles where they were. Shortly before the 1861 Battle of Ridge Mountain, Union soldiers who reportedly planned to rob the house of George Grove near Middle Fork in Upshur County were met by his wife, Nancy, who resolutely seized the fire shovel and the broomstick and applying them vigorously to the heads and shoulders of the cowardly thieving scams, obliged them to lay down the property and leave. When Union troops attempted to enter the home of Solomon Hedrick at the Mount of Seneca in Pendleton County, Mrs. Hedrick and daughter drove them back with no other weapons but an axe and a pitchfork. Martha Hedrick used the axe with great effect upon the skull of one man while her daughter ran the pitchfork into another's eye. Yes, <laughs> I don't know that I, I would have the nerve. On the other side of the conflict, Marcia Phillips described June 27, 1861, as a day of terror in French Creek. When news that southern troops were coming reached the town, families fled to the woods, secreting their wearing apparel and bedclothes and burying their provisions. Trying to be brave, Marcia in issues of the New York Tribune, a paper with an abolitionist editorial position, only because 
other members of the house urged her to do so. With most of the men and guns gone, Marcia noted, a sharpened my butcher knife, made a sheath for it, and hung it to my belt and resolved, I would not leave my home alive. Mary Jane Snyder was the 19-year-old daughter of John Snyder, a leader of pro-union sympathizers in Tucker and Randolph counties. On August 18, 1862, Mary Jane learned that in Bowdoin, with 300 men, was near his father's camp along the Cheat River, not far from St. George in Tucker County. She decided to make a 25-mile journey to let her father know. And next morning, she got a horse and traveled to Captain Snyder's camp with the news. As a result of Mary Jane's actions, Snyder moved his men before Imboden's men surrounded the camp. A few days later, Cyrus Kittle of the 107th Militia praised her actions and wished long life to her. Sometime after the event, a narrative poem entitled The Midnight Ride of Jane Snyder was written, which one Tucker County historian indicated in the 1960s was occasionally recited in the area at that time. And this is actually a portion of it. It's very long, but these are the parts that actually reference her or her activity. Um, much of the rest of it is more generally about emboldened coming and, and without any reference to her. So, but these are the passages where she and what she did are described. A small number of women were willing to spy or engage in violent activities in support of their cause. And I know this would be normally where we would talk about Nancy, Han uh, not Nancy Hanks, Nancy Hart, and Bill Boyd, but as I said, I'm not going to. Another Mary Jane, 17-year-old Mary Jane Green from Braxton County, was first arrested by federal authorities in August 1861 in Sutton for carrying letters to a Confederate camp on the Gauley River. According to one account, she was illiterate, perfectly fearless, and cordially hated the Yankee vagabonds as she termed the federal troops. She was noted for her profanity, and when, with the rest of the family, she was arrested, cursed and swore like a professional blackleg or horse racer, declaring that she would have the heart's blood of every Lincoln pup in western Virginia. When on her way to Clarksburg, in charge of Lieutenant George E. O'Neill, her language was such, he declared, as to almost disgust him with the sex. While confined in prison, she abused passers-by, shouted lustily for Jeff Davis and the Southern Confederacy, and swore she would have the heart of General Rosecrans if she was ever released. Jailed in Wheeling in the spring of 1862, General Rosecrans ordered her sent home to Braxton County with the hope and expectation that the Union troops would shoot her, according to Provost Marshal Joseph Dar. She had not been free long until she was brought to Wheeling again in May 1862, charged with destroying the telegraph wire built by the federal troops near Weston. She assaulted one of the soldiers who had charge of her, striking him in the breast with a brick. Thinking it inadvisable to release her again, Dar suggested detention in a house of refuge, which is kind of like a reform facility for juveniles, but was unable to have her placed in one in Cincinnati. Apparently released and arrested several more times, I can't imagine why you would want to have released her, but in the spring of 1863, she was sent to Washington, D.C., where she reportedly spent the remainder of the war in prison. Maggie Reed, youngest daughter 
of William and Lucinda Reed of Barker County was arrested near Buchanan on June 10, 1863, charged with attempting to cross Union picket lines, being a spy, conveying mails to rebels, and disloyalty. During Imboden's raid, she carried a Confederate flag on the public highway that was made by her sister, Lucinda Radabaugh. The day she was arrested, she had crossed the river and gone through fields to avoid the pickets, but when she tried to recross the river, she was caught. Maggie Reed had no qualms about admitting her Confederate sympathies. According to evidence gathered the day after her arrest, she said, I am a secesh and don't deny it, and there is no use in multiplying words about it. As it so happens in looking at the journal of Marcia Phillips, Marcia, who was then living in Buchanan, on June 10, 1863, recorded in her diary that she and several other women had been requested to search a female spy whom she described as an ideal specimen of the female Southern Confederacy. No doubt this was Maggie Reed. She raved and foamed and said she expected to be shining in glory while we were burning in hell, Marcia wrote. <laughs> Lucinda Radabaugh soon took the oath of loyalty, but Maggie was sent to Wheeling. Housed in one of the debtor's rooms at the jail, she was injured during an incident in July. She testified that the jailer hit her in the head with the butt of his pistol, kicked her, and struck her on the back with a cowhide. The doctor was summoned to examine a wound on her head as well as marks on her back. Despite the fact that she was supported in at least part of her testimony by several others, the grand jury declined to find an indictment against the jailer. And in part, it seems that they felt or may have felt that, well, she kind of got what she deserved. What do you expect if you're, you know, a Confederate supporter and you know, you're creating trouble? In the meantime, several residents of Barber County, including Spencer Dayton, who had served in the first and second Wheeling conventions, petitioned Governor Arthur Borman for her release, noting that during her residency in Barber County, she had never been charged with disloyalty, and that if released, we will vouch for her good future conduct. She took the oath of allegiance and was given transport to Webster. Although there's no further indications of disloyal activity, after the war, Maggie Reed moved to New Orleans and married a Southerner from South Carolina. Another supporter of the Confederacy who came to the attention of military authorities is Kate Brown. What Kate did is not exactly clear, given the fact that her sanity came into question. Age 16 in late 1862 and a resident of Big Birch, Kate claimed that she and 10 other girls had been cooking for a large group of guerrillas that included several of her brothers when she was asked to spy on Union troops in Sutton and to burn a bridge there. She also claimed variously that she was present when the telegraph wires were cut near Sutton and that she had cut them. Colonel Thomas M. Harris of the 10th West Virginia thought her exceedingly ignorant, ill-bred, and vicious, and believed it unwise to set her at liberty after she was arrested and sent to Wheeling. That's exactly what happened in February 1863, however, when she was paroled to Buchanan. Soon thereafter, Kate violated the terms of her parole by returning to Braxton County and associating with the guerrillas. She was rearrested on March 5th and was in the guardhouse at Bulltown, which she had reportedly had torn to pieces. Soldiers could not succeed in sending her on as they had been ordered to do because she refused to walk and would lay down in the mud in refusal. The officer in charge believed she was insane an opinion he reported was shared by several people who had known her for some time. In his communication, he seemed to suggest releasing her, however, which I think is interesting considering, again, you know, you have these repeated arrests and releases of, of some of these women. What happened next is not 
not known, but she was free in early June when she was taken into custody again. Kate claimed that she had been with her brother, Wesley Brown, and a commander of a company of guerrillas who had captured Captain Nimrod Har of the 10th West Virginia Infantry, and that she was present when they shaved off his hair. Now, Hire was captured. Uh, I have not seen an account of his hair being shaved, but he ended up being uh, in prison, uh, a prisoner of war for a while, and so it may have been the least of his troubles after the war was over to think about the fact that his hair was shaved off. Kate was returned to jail in Wheeling, where she became an absolute nuisance, not only to the occupants of the jail, but to everybody in the neighborhood. In addition to using profane language, she threw her meals out of the window, yelled like a yahoo at night, and pounded on the cell door. In January 1864, Kate attempted to escape with a fellow female prisoner, and interestingly, the article goes on to say that the two of them uh, sort of came back and turned themselves in. But then a few months later, she was in Columbus, Ohio, seeking return to West Virginia. At that time, the provost marshal made it clear she would not be allowed to return to Braxton County. And the Union Citizens file didn't have anything beyond that to explain what may have happened to Kate. We have another, and, and I have to say that it seems like we're, we're talking about a lot of Confederate women, but you do have to realize that the nature of a lot of the sources, uh, if you came into contact with the government, a lot of times it was because you were misbehaving. If you got mentioned in the newspaper, it's because you were doing something that was really considered out of the ordinary, and that could mean something like, cutting telegraph wires or uh, yelling like a yahoo or, or things like that. That at that time, women who were behaving the way they were supposed to be behaving, or at least the way it was thought, a lot of times got no recognition. The, the fact that some of the, the activities of the women who made articles, sent articles on for soldiers, and the fact that there was mention of those kind of activities is more unusual than not because a lot of what women did went unnoticed within the press. And so I did want to note that because I seem to be talking about a lot of Confederate women and which might lead you to think that we were 80% Confederate women. And here is another one. In Morgan County, a woman named Mary Ogden troubled Union supporters. In May 1862, Governor Pierpont received a letter from Sir John's Run, signed simply, a Union woman, complaining about the actions of Mary Ogden. According to this writer, Ogden has taken a very active part in the rebellion and has been of more service than a whole regiment of soldiers, helping Confederate messengers cross the Potomac River, carrying information to the Army, informing on Union men. When Stonewall Jackson's army left in January, she left as well, but had recently returned. Instead of being arrested, she is surrounded by federal officers who are trying to win her smiles. The 1860 census for Morgan County lists a Mary Ogden who was in her 20s and had two young children. She was living in Sir John's Run in the house of Delilah Leopard and I believe would have been her mother and her brother JB and a sister Louisa. The letter writer, this Union woman, stated that she, the woman was separated from her husband, who was a Union man. 
Her opinion of Mary Ogden was confirmed by C.L. Graflin, who characterized Ogden as a dangerous woman. She had cut the flag down once and threatened to cut it down again. When she was refused to pass into the Confederate lines in Hedgesville, she simply crossed the river and got horses for herself and another woman and went to Confederate headquarters. On another occasion, she traveled to Winchester and visited a member of Virginia's Confederate legislature. Graflin expressed fear that her trips behind Confederate lines would lead to the burning of the bridges across Sleepy Creek and the Great Cacapon and urged her arrest. And in one of these letters, it seems clear that Colonel Campbell, uh, it was the, uh, I believe it was the 54th Pennsylvania, was aware of her as a problem and apparently the officers were some of his men and as you see I have put up a part of that letter here where Graflin says that uh, and that that actually was leading to problems between he and some of his officers. One particularly horrific account from the Wayne Cabell County area, and I will give due credit to Joe Geiger for bringing this to my attention, uh, indicates not only the vindictiveness of some, which some women were capable, but also the bravery they could exhibit in the face of possible death. When two soldiers of the 34th Ohio and their guide were captured by local militia in December 1861 and taken to the mill run by a Mrs. Gilkinson, a discussion about what to do with them followed. Mrs. Gilkinson reportedly stated that she wished one to be killed on her porch so that she could dance in his blood. That was not done. But one by one, the men were taken a short distance from the mill and shot. Later in the month, Company F of the 34th Ohio was in the area where the men were killed and tried to locate their bodies. One soldier recounted the effort. There was a woman a run in the mill. The boys tried to make her tell where they was buried, but she would not tell. The boys threatened to shoot and draw their guns on her, but she would not tell. And turning to uh, rather unsavory, or partially unsavory, another group of women were those who spent time at the camps. And there were women who sold pies, cakes, <coughs> apples, and other goods, but there were also some rather unsavory goings on. According to one account from New Creek, when one, one woman was searched, she was discovered to have a bottle of liquor concealed at each breast and another below the waistband. William Mattingly, the commander of the post at Clarksburg, sent Mary Summers to Wheeling in April of 1863 for engaging in activities that one might associate with the term camp follower. Mary has been laying about our camps, and in all probability has diseased half of the company at this post, <laughs> Captain Mattingly informed Major Dar. Mary, who reportedly had been dressed as a soldier, and several other women were taken to Pennsylvania and there dropped down to take care of themselves. Henry Fitzalan enlisted in the 23rd Regiment, Kentucky Infantry, in 1861 and came to the Kanawha Valley with an Ohio Regiment the following year. Henry was arrested on December 20th, 1862, having aroused suspicion of being a spy because Henry was a woman. Marion McKenzie. Marion denied spying for the Confederacy, but she was sent to Wheeling. Major Joseph Dorr, Provost Marshal, attempted unsuccessfully to have her place in a house of refuge in Ohio. Around the same time, an Ohio woman by the name of Mary Jane Prater was arrested in Charleston on the charge of being a Confederate spry. She had met a couple of soldiers from the 2nd West Virginia Cavalry in Gallipolis, 
put on soldiers' clothing, and enlisted in the cavalry company. After holding both Mary Jane Prater and Marion McKenzie for several months, in early May, Dar was informed by the Commissary General of Prisoners in Washington that if there are any charges of disloyalty against Mary and McKenzie or Mary Jane Prater, he will send them also. Wearing soldiers' clothing in camp is not an offense for which they can be sent south. And if that is all that is against them, they must be disposed of in some other way. Dar sent Marion and Mary Jane to Pennsylvania at the same time Mary Summers was sent. But Mary and Mackenzie apparently continued to join other military units throughout the war. Mary Jane Prater quickly turned up in Wellsburg dressed in boys' clothes and was given 30 days in jail. Now, according to the Wheeling Intelligencer, at that time she professed to be a Southern woman and a Jeff Davis man. But looking on to the Union side again, in 1863, Marcia Phillips wrote a letter to the Wheeling Intelligencer in which she criticized General B.S. Roberts for what she considered his abandonment of Upshur County during the Jones and Bode break. She also criticized his proclamation of April 6th regarding the destruction of railroads, bridges, and the like. And in his proclamation, he had suggested they were subject to that sort of destruction from the Confederates. But Marsha's comment, we have found the prophetic Roberts so far to be more destructive on bridges than the enemy against whom the proclamation warned us. Because, of course, it was the federal troops who destroyed the burning of who destroyed the bridge at Buchanan, and she considered the burning of that bridge to have been a piece of folly, and concluded its destruction would be no hindrance to the enemy whatsoever. Famine stares us, her unhappy children, in the face. Our grain, scarcely enough, is left for seed. Our fields, many of them, are still unplowed, and where are our horses to plow them? Where are our men to plant them? And the interesting thing is if she had not mentioned that she had written a letter to the Wheeling Intelligencer in her journal, I wouldn't have found it. This is, this is the letter that she wrote uh, because it was only signed with her initials, which again was very typical for women, for their names not to appear if they did contribute something. But because she referenced it, and I knew from her journal that it dealt with Roberts, I started looking through the paper about that time period, and when I came across one on that subject and recognized her initials, I knew that I had the letter she had written. As the war continued, some women found themselves in increasingly difficult circumstances. Those with Virginia money soon found it worth less than face value. According to one account, by October 1861, $1 of Virginia currency brought scarcely 75 cents in wheeling. And the cost of goods rose during the war. As early as November 1861, Isabella Woods of Barber County observed, I'm afraid the war will last longer than my money. Living in Hardy County, Rebecca Van Meter and her sisters Ann and Susan were in the midst of constant troop movements and faced repeated losses in livestock and produce and through requests from soldiers for food. When Union soldiers took their oxen in November 1864, Rebecca, who by then was 65 years of age, followed the soldiers, obtained return of the oxen, or I guess I should say release of the oxen to her custody, the oxen being all we had to haul our winter provision. And she set out for home. That was a journey of about six miles and she, because she was afraid to start out on the turnpike, 
she passed through a long meadow with what she characterized as deep ditches and that also required her to lower fence rails so that she could take the oxen through and only after a certain distance did she, did she then make her way to the turnpike and proceed on home. Early in 1863, Colonel John Paxton of the 2nd West Virginia Cavalry wrote a letter from Camp Piot to his parents in which he noted that the post was providing food for about 300 women and children. And he had heard of them starving to death 40 miles away. When Wheeling citizens surveyed the wards to identify the families of soldiers that needed assistance, they discovered 121 families in six of the city's seven wards needed help, and some of them were so destitute that they needed immediate help. A few examples from around the state, Clementina Maxwell of Harrison County was the mother of five children. She had lost one husband, Floyd Mountain, and her second husband was a prisoner in the South. Another woman, Mary E. Freeburn of Independence in Preston County, had been receiving rations until May of 1864. A year later, when she asked to draw rations again at the commissary at Grafton, her husband Robert, a sergeant in the 14th West Virginia Infantry, had died in a southern prison. She had two children. When acquaintances of Doretha Hardman of Harrison County asked that she be awarded rations in 1864, her husband was a private in the 12th West Virginia, yet she was very poor and destitute and had six children to feed but no means of support. On this, my 18th birthday, I must write a little in you, my journal, Sirene Button of French Creek Road on April 11, 1865. With the news that Richmond had fallen and Lee surrendered, she continued, We are in hope now that the war will soon end. It makes me feel sad to think of the desolated homes all over the country, fathers, mothers, and sisters, all mourning for those that will never come again. Ah me, what might have been. Cyrene had lost two of her three brothers to the war and had been to the funerals of several other soldiers. Many women in West Virginia, whether they had supported the Union or the Confederacy, likely felt as she did when the war ended. Many had lost loved ones or homes and other possessions. For some, the prospects for the future seemed grim. Some women had found they were capable of doing things of which they may never have imagined themselves capable. Regardless, the war had surely changed their lives forever. Thank you. I don't suppose if anybody has any questions, I'll <coughs> give it the good old college try. Yes. Um, there also, as I think I mentioned at one point, the Union Citizen files that are at the National Archives and are available through Fold 3. And one of our staff people who uh, has a subscription to that, he printed out some of those for me. Uh, some of the stuff was from primary source material that we have here in the archives, and then others have actually been published. Uh, Rebecca Van Meter, that's a recent publication of her journal, and we actually do have a copy over there on our new titles shelf. Uh, the same is true of Isabella Woods. Uh, the letters that she wrote to her husband while she was, well, during the war, really, because after she left, uh, she continued to correspond with him when he was away from home. Uh, 
And, and I will say, the wheeling, the, uh, the nurses, that there, uh, Linda Flaherty has a website, and she had put up some of the, the pensions that some of these women receive, the uh, transcription that we do. Uh, we do have some that I didn't include, but I certainly wish that, that we did, not only for the Civil War period, but <coughs> any time when it comes to women. Any other questions? Do you have any information or idea about the two women buried in the period grave? I do not. As far as I know, that is still a complete mystery as to what their their identities. But that is certainly that that is something that has been around for a long time, and I can remember as a child going, you know through the carriage trail and uh, there be where that was, yeah, yeah, but I do not believe, to my knowledge, that anybody has ever nailed that one down. That makes it good. <laughs> uh, your presentation is really great, Mary, and it explains to me uh, a little better how the test code afterward, after the war was applied, because it applied to men and women, and kept women from being school teachers, which was one of the primary applications that they had at the time, until it was overturned in the 1870s. So that certainly explains that there was quite a bit of disloyalty and a natural sympathy for the South among the federal women, but really more active uh, opposition and resistance and so forth than what I uh, give the credit for. Yeah, I think that <coughs> initially, Obviously, from some of this, I think they were much more lenient about what some of the Confederate women would say or do. Uh, but then they began to see the negative impact of that, of, of letting them just, you know, go around and express uh, not only that they were pro-Southern, but you know, instances of actually spitting on a soldier or something like that, uh, and they began to take a harsher line with them. And there was also, you know, concern with, with some of them that they could be spies, they could be passing on information. The interesting thing when you see the, the women who did get passes and went and saw their husbands, these tended to be men who were, I guess you'd say, more important. And they had that sort of gentleman's agreement kind of thing. If you were an officer and a gentleman, and you were somebody maybe they had known before the war under different circumstances, it was like, if you promised, you know, and, and like in the case of uh, Ellen Tompkins, you know, she said, I won't, I won't tell anything. And, and uh, I can't remember whether it was General Cox or whatever, you know, in his letter uh, that uh, Chris, uh, Christopher Tompkins wouldn't try to get any information out of her because she easily, you know, being so close to the activities of the <coughs> unions and camp right on her property, she could have potentially provided information. So that's something, you know, nowadays we just don't think, we can't fathom that people would take the word that they would do that. But as I said, that tended to be a certain class of people that they would treat in that manner. 